Greetings, brothers and sisters and people of goodwill. Thank you so very much for joining me today for this edition of Diopian Style. My name is Chuck Penn. It's Black History Month, and I've got a beauty for you today. I've got a chance to spend some quality time with Professor Mainu Ampim, and Brother Mainu has been traveling to and fro throughout Europe and Africa, visiting all the European museums and North African museums with all the stolen artifacts. He's been doing it for 30 years, and he has documented the long and storied history of African heritage people. He's also found a bunch of forgeries out there, too, and he'll touch on some of that. So check out this segment right here, because this brother dropped a whole lot of knowledge nuggets on us. Check it out. Professor Ampin, thank you so much for joining us today, brother. I know you've been busy, and I really appreciate you taking out the time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us and share with us uh, the breadth of your knowledge and your research that you've been doing for decades. And uh, I think it's probably appropriate to start out by mentioning your book, A History of African Civilizations, which I have consumed uh, in detail. Why don't we start right there, and you can go right on into your presentation. Well, thank you, Brother Chuck. I, I appreciate the, uh, the invitation to, to round two, actually, because I think round one, we just kind of scratched the surface to deal with uh, Africana studies and and the importance of primary or firsthand research. Well, you know, my book, A History of African Civilizations, is just that. It's about African civilizations before uh, colonialism, before slavery, and before Africa was derailed. And I wrote the book not only to support the students that I teach at Contra Costa College here in Northern California, but why teach a subject and have a book if I'm not also making it available to the community. So I decided to make it so that it's not only a uh, a practical book for students and also for teachers and faculty members at every level, middle school, high school, college, university, because I have lesson plans, but also it's available uh, to the general public in, in different bookstores and for people to learn about African civilizations. So that's one of the things that I really wanted to make sure I uh, presented. So I'll just, so here's the cover of my book and uh, it's the second revised edition. It's the second uh, revised edition because uh, I've been obviously teaching African civilizations for quite some time, but uh, this is just off the press uh, several months ago and in the book, it's a um, it's a delve into the significant African contributions to humanity, and not only a survey but specific details in some cases that really gives us insight about the significance of uh, of now the the term is the significance of classical African civilizations and the term civilizations or civilization it has to be really um, examined because that term is used pretty pretty uh, freely when it comes to Europe. Every time we turn around, there's some reference to Western Civ. It's so popular, people don't even, even pronounce the entire term. But when we deal with Africa, it's not, in most cases, civilizations, but people want to reduce it down to African cultures or mm -hmm. African peoples in order to reduce the significance. So I wanted to make sure that I define civilization, and really the best way to understand it is the root word of, of civilization is the word civil. And civil is when you have peaceful and uh, harmonious relations. So really, civilizations is peaceful and harmonious relations among people and between people and their environment. And so when we look at the civilizations, the oldest that take us back into uh, ancient times, into antiquity, are African civilizations that actually go back quite a number of uh, a millennia, many, many thousands of years. And not only the grand civilizations, as you see here, this is the great Taharqa, the greatest builder in the history of Kush. And there's more pyramids, there's more monuments uh, in, South, in Sudan than there is in actual Kemet. There's twice as many pyramids there. And Taharqa is the great builder. Everywhere we look in the Nile Valley, his DNA, his fingerprints were on great monuments that last for eternity. And so uh, there's no other place to start. So we're familiar with the, the grand and extraordinary civilizations, but when we look at the root of it, it's not just the great monuments and the great structures that defy time. They're important. But the original civilizations are the small stature people that 
the Europeans derogatorily called so-called pygmies. We should never refer to the small stature of Africans who are four foot eight, four foot ten, uh, because they're the ones that lived in harmonious environments. So these are egalitarian societies, and sometimes we call them uh, communal societies because they were really based on uh, communalism, where there's no structure. There's no hierarchy, there's no chiefs, there's no kings, but you have harmonious relations among those people. So that's where we have to start with looking at those harmonious relations among them and the, the profound harmony with the environment. And later on, long after that time, then we have the most extraordinary civilizations. And the classical civilizations in chronological order, the oldest would be Kush, and then Nubia, and then Kemet. And we're talking about the Northeast African region in the Nile Valley. So uh, there's much that we can say. It would take uh, many, many hours, dozens and hundreds and thousands of hours to go through it. But really briefly, um, one thing that we can focus on are contributions, such as in the field of writing. And uh, one of the, the, the most important things that Africans were able to give to the world is writing. So the yeah. first book ever written was written by this man here, Ptah Hotep. And he was Ptah a philosopher, right? Yeah, right. He, he, he was a moral philosopher. Yes, a moral philosopher, moral teacher, uh, prime minister, which is you know pretty equivalent to our, in the U.S., it would be equivalent to a vice president. But you couldn't have a high title or position like that until, until you were first a spiritual practitioner. So he was a high priest, which allowed him to have a high office in the government. But he's most important for us because he wrote the first complete book in the history of the world, 37 Lessons on Ethical and Moral Conduct going back 4,400 years. And this is not myth, legend, or fable, but you're looking at an actual image of the Africoid high official Pata Hotep. And um, how about that? The first book ever written in the history of humanity was not about fighting, not about a eye for eye or two for two, not about chopping somebody's hand off if they if they allegedly stole something, but the book of Patahotep, um here and what you see here, this book was about ethical and moral conduct. And that's the first book and first focus of a book that we have on record. So it's about developing moral conduct and showing great character. And, and you know what, you know what, Professor, excuse me, you know what blew my mind in reading your book about Patahotep is as I read what he wrote, it could, it sounded or it read almost like uh, it, it, some the Proverbs out of the, out of the Christian Bible, out of Psalms, out of the Christian Bible. I mean, that's the, the, the depth that it had. I mean, it was really fascinating. I was one of the most uh, enjoyable Portions of your book was reading of all of the ancient uh, philosophers and and folks that wrote uh, from the very beginnings of time. Yes, sir. Well, that that's a great um, uh, comment there because, in fact, the Book of Ptolemy and other uh, books of wise instructions from Kemet are actually the model and the direct influence to the uh, Song of Solomon and the Book of Proverbs in the Bible. Studies have been done that clearly. This kind of uh, coincidence and word for word copying didn't just it didn't just happen. So that the book of Talmud is thousands of years older, literally thousands of years older than the biblical text. And the reason why we can make the connection is not only because the wisdom text and the moral teaching they call it didactic literature, which is literature that teaches a moral value. It's not just that the literature in Kemet is older, but there's a direct influence. So, for example, anybody that is a Christian knows that Moses is supposed to be the lawgiver. He gives them the codes of conduct. But the Bible says in, in Book of Acts 7.22 that Moses was, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. So if Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the people of Kemet, then he had to have studied all of these books. He could not have learned all of the wisdom unless he went through that educational system, reading books like the Book of Ptah and Amenemope and uh, so many great moral teachers who taught great lessons, which we can use today. So this kind of contribution is uh, set in stone because it ain't going anywhere because the documents don't lie and they can't be, uh, 
they you know they they can't be expunged at this point because we have too many definitive records to document uh this ancient evidence all right brother continue on okay well you know so there's the writing and uh you know one thing about patal tep if 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 people really uh look at this it's profound because it's actually a a, a, a uh, it's a guide for a, a moral life a ethical life of life of great character and uh so patal tep teaches people how to how to let your name go forth uh, in good standing because there's nothing worse than a foul name so how do you stay out of the ta the tavern how do you avoid conflict and quarreling. How do you remain a, a a person with a good name and a good reputation? And obviously, people know that your name precedes you. And Patalo Tep teaches about those lessons. How do you respect your elders? How do you gain respect among your peers? And so this is the great lessons that he's teaching. Forty four hundred years ago, now if somebody goes on on a on online, they might see that the Chinese quote unquote wrote the first book. How in the world can the Chinese write the first book thousand more than 2,000 years after Batao Tep's book? Here's how the propagandists have attempted to approach this. That here, here, here we're looking at one scroll. Mm -hmm. It's just it's one continuous scroll with 37 lessons of ethical and moral conduct. And it's a book because it's on one surface, one scroll dealing with one general topic. And it's 37 different lessons. And this is the cursive form of the writing system, Medu Netcher, or what people know as hieroglyphics. But so it's usually two colors. Black is the main text, and the red represents a new lesson. So when you see red in a in a document such as this to teach teach uh, wisdom, then it's new lessons that uh or new chapter or new lessons. Um uh, and um and then if, if it was a medical text, for example, it would be a new uh, a new case, a new medical case. If it was a mathematical papyrus uh, text, then it would be a new problem. So when when, when we see red, then it means it's, it's uh, you know, something new there. But Patal Tep is able to teach these great lessons. So it is the, the world's oldest book. All the Chinese did was they took the scroll and cut it into individual sheets and bound it. Well, that doesn't exclude the fact that Patal Tep wrote the first book, because if people want to be technical and split hairs and completely misrepresent his historical contribution, then there's no such things as books in the Bible, for that matter, because the books in the Bible are also written on scrolls. They weren't put in any kind of ma manner where the long scrolls, sometimes they can be five feet, 10 feet or whatever, they, they didn't didn't cut the scrolls and then bind them. So if Patao Tep's book is somehow not a book, then you cannot talk about the books of the Bible. This is simply modern misrepresentation and fraudulent uh, so-called uh, scholarship, if you want to call it that, in order to, to separate Black people from our contributions to humanity. But make no mistake about it, this is the first book. This is a this is the, the, the text that everyone had to learn from when they were young. And we know that it's permeated the educational system in Kemet because of the fact that there were various copies found, meaning that it was taught pretty widely in the country. And one of the things that Patal Tep discusses is the concept of ma'at and building character because character means to build and ma'at helped one to one embrace ma'at that's the great law the great principle of truth justice righteousness or in other words ma'at was divine law that kept the planets in their orbit it was ma'at that was responsible for the alternation of day and night it was Ma'at that made sure there was regulation in the natural world as well. So Ma'at was, was responsible for order, and um, and one was expected to do Ma'at, think Ma'at, uh, uh, breathe Ma'at, and have Ma'at become an intuitive part of his or her character. This is profound teaching, but it wasn't just about teaching. It was more about practice, and because the practice is what separated people from just abstract theory. So Patajo Tep, among other writers, teaches people about leadership. As he says here, do great things which will be remembered long after you. It's about reputation. It's about legacy. And we don't learn that in the Western school system. And one of the things that we should, should know about the teaching system and practice in Kemet is that the most common verb, 
the most common verb used was the word sejum. Sejum translates into listening or hearing. So to hear well or to listen well, this is the, the great instructions of Patal Tep. If you're the son and daughter, if your son and daughter accept the righteous teachings of their parents, none of their plans will go well or will go wrong. Teach your children then to be those that hear well. And skipping to the bottom, respected are those that listen well. This is part of the great wisdom and the great scribal tradition in Kemet. This is one of the great contributions because obviously the importance of writing is communication. So this allowed us to take a leap forward in in uh, in the in the society of men and women, and and that is writing. So there's writing on papyrus when there's just documents, letters, and things like that that have to be sent out. It's just a quick cursive writing. Cursive is just a faster way to, to write rather than print. And then the other format in which they wrote, you see a couple of scribes here. You see the black and red and the reed brush in their hand, but they also uh, documented and wrote and communicated on stone. This is when the, the glyphs, the images were perfect. This is when the masters did their masterful work. So here on the left, this work is done by the master. Uh, and this work here was done on the left, on, on the right here is lighter because it was done by students. And when students sometimes make mistakes, notice they're drawing the arm and, and a hand. And here the thumb looks a little bit deformed. No problem, it's a student. <laughs> so sometimes they got to practice. So you see all of the practicing here. That's why it's lighter because they had to erase any mistakes or errors. But the master on the left, this part of the stone is darker because this, he's, he's a master. So you see the grid system, the horizontal grid, the the the, 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 the 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 horizontal grid, the vertical grid. And so there were always a mathematical formula for seated uh, images. And then it was a formula for standing images. So if you see the horizontal uh, lines here following my cursor, so from the sole of the feet to the hairline, it should be, the, the standard 14, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So they can take a small image and make it colossal 60 feet high, and the anatomical precision is stunning. So this is the kind of mathematical system and mathematical calculation that went into the high-level art. So it's not only writing, but it's a whole nother level of execution. That's why when people see images from Kemet, they're stunned. It does something to us. So it's not just the letters that we know of, uh, like the 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 the, the Roman uh, characters and script, but they use images, pictograms, because it has an immediate uh, impact on us. But also science is involved. So if we look, and one other thing here, I can also show a little bit about medicine. So Imhotep, for example, he's the first known doctor in the history of humanity. Not one of, but the first known doctor. Now, I didn't say he was the first doctor, but he's the first known doctor. What that means is that there would have been doctors in classical Africa before Imhotep. We just don't know them by name. So this is why we say he's the first known doctor going back to ancient antiquity. So the Greeks simply copied everything. So when someone says sees Escalapius, that's the Greek name for the much older Imhotep or Hippocrates, uh, so-called father of medicine, not the father of, of medicine in general. If you want to say the father of Greek medicine, that's fine. But so from Hippocrates, we get the so-called Hippocratic Oath. And it, this is the oath that all doctors have to take, that they won't harm the patient. They, 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 they won't reveal information about the patient. And it also says that they will not perform an abortion. It says that. Mm -hmm. So somebody can take the Hippocratic Oath, oath or, or they can may be more true to the African origin of this kind of insight and really call it what it should be. That is the Imhotepian Oath. Mm -hmm. rather than using some Greek name. And I actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a sister here that went with me to Kemet one year, and she said she and her physician friends, when they took their oath, they certainly did take the Imhotepian oath, and they didn't take the Hippocratic oath. <laughs> Absolutely. And matter of fact, Imhotep was so powerful as a physician and as an architect and a writer. He was so powerful 
in his day during the third dynasty, the pyramid age in Kemet, that thousands of years later, the foreigners, when the Greeks came around, they literally began to worship, as you mentioned, uh, Brother Chuck, they, they, they began to literally worship and hold him, hold up as a, hold him up as a deity. He was not worshipped when he lived in Kemet, but he certainly was worshipped by the foreigners who were at awe and, um, of his greatness. He's designer of the step pyramid here. He's the, the chief architect as well. The very first in the world, in the history of the world. Absolutely. And so we have this kind of evidence. And while we're talking about the the brother in Hotep, we got to add the sister in here. This is Pesha Shep, and she's the first known doctor in the history of the world. And here she is here. She's seated on the bottom left, Pesha Shep. Uh, she came a little bit after him to Imhotep, but she's the first known female doctor. But what's interesting about her titles, remember what I mentioned a minute ago, no one can have high status unless they were a spiritual practitioner. So she was uh, she was head of the female priestesses. So she was a director of priestesses as one title, but she also was the director. And notice this category. They had a whole category of female physicians. So this is why it's important to describe it accurately, that she's the first known female doctor, but clearly she comes from a, from a, an area of specialty where there were actual female doctors that were identified as a group, as a collective. So we know that this is a long-standing tradition, long before patients shed around the end of the fourth dynasty or fifth dynasty, that would put us right around 2,500 BCE or 4,500 years ago. These are unique African contributions to humanity. I dare somebody talk about some Greek father of, of medicine when you have a, a much longer tradition that are thousands of years older. And then here is another African contribution that's tangible, but the problem is that there's misrepresentation. And, and the way in which people steal African history, which, which is done deliberately and arrogantly, is this is what we're looking at here is the oldest surgical document in the world, the oldest. 48 cases of dealing with neurosurgery. And again, we see the black and the red, 48 cases. And this this actually, this, this papyrus is broken off, but it's, it's a systematic clinical assessment of injuries, broken bones, lacerations, and uh, and blows to the skull, or if there's some kind of skull injury, it's a clinical assessment, and 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 it's very detailed, very scientific analysis. This is why it's not odd. It's definitely not odd if somebody sees uh, medical physicians today and medical researchers refer in the Journal of the the, the American Medical Association or JAMA in that um, professional publication refer to here's the problem the so-called edwin smith surgical papyrus yeah, yeah. how did they get that name yeah because he purchased it so anytime a a, uh, a a european from either europe or someone of europe descent in the u.s they would purchase and this all took place in the 1800s they took african or bought african documents and and uh, and then had the documents named after them this is this is nothing but fraud. So that's why I have that in quotations. And I remember when this was displayed uh, some years ago at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. They had a big old uh, placard that that had the uh, that had the ridiculous words that this surgical document is named after the original owner. I said, "What? How can Edmund Smith, who purchased it in 1862?" which was more than 3,400 years <laughs> after it was written. He ain't the original owner. So the only thing we can do, honestly, is to get rid of this. Let's just get rid of the name and stop playing games and not allow people to misrepresent history by misnaming documents. So if nothing else, it's got to be the ancient Egyptian or ancient African, ancient Comitian, but it cannot be the Edmund Smith uh, uh, surgical doc, uh, surgical document, but this is the oldest surgical document in the history of the world, going back at least sixteen hundred before the Common Era. And uh, I mean, what a clinical assessment! If, if someone reads 
this and translated this, they recognized that Africans had an intimate knowledge of the neural system. Uh, the, and, and so, uh, like, for example, I mean, you start dealing with the brain and the central nervous system, that is very, very sensitive. But they were able to give astute analysis. So if somebody had a had a blow to the right side of their head, they indicate look for some paralysis on the left side. They knew that from observation and uh, and study. And and now the reason why Africans were thousands of years ahead of the Greeks, for example, because the ancient Greeks thought it was evil to cut on the human body and do any surgery. So they were very backward. Whereas Africans understood that you can learn a lot and they became masters. That's why you have these areas of specialty. And this here is a skull. I'm showing it because there's the telltale signs of trepanation. Trepanation is when a, a, a hole is drilled in the skull to relieve pressure um, on the brain so that if somebody has a blow to the head, then the brain swells. So there's a hole drilled in the skull to relieve pressure. And so here you can't see it that much, but there's an indentation right here. I can see because, it. Yes, you can see it. And this is where the drilling took place to relieve the pressure. And the reason why there's not a hole in the skull is quite simple. The patient survived. If the patient didn't didn't survive, we would certainly see a hole. And you can see a little bit better here. But this is the first known trepanation in the history of the world, drilling a hole in the skull to relieve pressure on the brain because it's swelling for whatever kind of trauma uh, that was there. But the, again, same thing with the name misrepresenting a unique African contribution. We have an academic website presenting a game called Trepanation. And this is preposterous. This is outlandish. This is nothing but modern theft. Where here it is, Europe had no knowledge of Trepanation until it was first established and uh, by Africans, and they learn from African physicians. And uh, now, about uh, someone can buy a game, and you you have two 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 white children playing in the skull after they drilled a hole hole in it. Ha ha ha! He he he! This is very fun. But where's the connection to Africa? So this is what we are dealing with: is this kind of gross misrepresentation, whereby the world does not even know the unique and profound and lasting and very central contributions that Africans have made to humanity because of this kind of uh, outrageous presentation where everybody now has lost their melanin. And so uh, and the average person wouldn't even think twice about it. But we know that there was at least 200 medical terms. Um, everything in the body was named, eyes, nose, lips, ears, all of the organs uh, named because they understood them including the brain, the central nervous system, what an analysis, what an, a body of knowledge they had, all of the organs, the skeletal system, all of that. But there's also another document. There's about 10 medical documents that survived from Kemet, but uh, about 10. But this is another one I'll just point out uh, finally. And, and again, we have the same problem. Ebers is simply the European that bought the document again in the 1860s. But it is a document that's minimally 1500 BCE. So here again, we're talking more than 3,000 years later, a modern European purchaser, George Ebers, buys the African document and then somehow is named after him as if he had something to do with it. Now, what's difference between, different between this papyrus and the, the, um, the surgical one is this deals with internal medicine. So it deals with diseases, diagno diagnosis, and treatments for all kinds of different illnesses. And uh, a 66-foot-long papyrus with 877 cases. I mean, this is a level of knowledge that's extraordinary. And they were very comprehensive in dealing with all kinds of different uh, diseases. So this is one of the most important documents because it's the oldest dealing with internal medicine in the world. So these are some important contributions. The organs were known. Their function was known. The circulation of, of blood was known. They would preserve uh, the four vital organs in mummification, for example, uh, and and um, and uh, put them in containers for storage. But it's not just theory. We know that they were doing that not only because of the 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 African ancestors who have been called so-called mummies, which is a disrespectful term. 
but there's African ancestors that survived. Clearly, there's there's uh, the uh, the mummification. There's a surgery that's very insightful. We have the written documents as well. And here we have images. These are tools on one of the tomb walls. Here you see hooks. You see drills here. You see forceps. You see a, a, a knife. These are all used during surgery. In fact, if you look here, you see a scale. You see the one scale on the right mm -hmm. and being balanced with the scale on the left. Then you have an African concept that's stolen and on the back of the dollar bill, the all-seeing eye of Haru. You see it was a medical eye. Um, and uh, you see an incense uh, burner here, a sensor. So, so these are actual dozens of tools on the wall. And, and medical practice was so common. Here you have a physician on the left doing eye repair at work. This is a carpenter. This carpenter is kind of on the stairs, but he's fixing a column here as a, as a part of a building. So, um, you know, in the old days, the doctors used to make house calls. You know, and, and you and I have been around long enough to know that doctors used to make house calls, not so much these days, um, not like it was before. But here you have a physician making a job call as he's doing some kind of eye repair. This is how common the medical wow. practice were. This is African knowledge. And finally, here we are looking at the oldest or the first, if you want to call it that, because it's both. It's the oldest, it's the first. It's the oldest wooden toe or prosthetic toe in the history of the world. It's a 3,000-year-old toe from an African woman. And this is the right foot. So if you take a look at it, so this is uh, what they used to attach. This, this, uh, this was used to attach the, the big toe. So this is the big toe here made out of wood. And the rest of these are the actual toes of an African woman that lived 3,000 years ago. What's That's extraordinary, th this is, brother, this is absolutely extraordinary, not only because of the medical knowledge. So ain't nothing new about a prosthetic limb or a prosthetic anything. Here you're looking at the very first in the history of the world. And this is displayed in the uh, museum in Cairo. Uh, these days. And what's also significant is not only the mathematical knowledge, but but why did these physicians choose a super dark brown, almost black big toe? It was to match the skin tone. So all of those propagandists out there that want to take Kemet from African people, it is through it is through nothing but fantasy because documentation beats conversation every day of the week. And here's direct documentation, not only the advanced medical knowledge, but also the fact that these were Africoid people, such as this, this uh, super dark colored big toe. If they were some uh, some Arab types, as people would like to deceive themselves about, or some- or black some skin Indian whites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, so anyway, I mean, it's, it's much that we can share, but but clearly uh, these are very, very important things that we, we need to know about contributions. And this is just scratching the surface that I discuss in my uh, in my book. You, you know what, brother, what, what, this is a perfect trans, uh, time to transition into this whole notion of there being a, a white Egyptian. Why don't you go into, uh, in a chronological order, the, the the various invaders from 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 the uh, east who've come into uh, in, come into Africa in a chronological order. Give us some some sense of context because Hollywood unfortunately has spewed a lot of nonsense uh, by focusing in on the Ptolemaic era, which was when Egypt was in ruins. And very conveniently, uh, not focusing in on the, the, the thousands of years that preceded that time. Talk about that a little bit and who, when these invaders came in, uh, in, in, in terms of the, the chronological order. Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, that question. But one thing that is absolutely important for everyone is to follow the rules of a professional historian. So nothing ever makes sense until first we put it in historical context. So historical context or historical perspective, it means that two questions have to be answered, when and where. 
or time and place. So today, you know, maybe for the last five, six, seven years, it's pretty common for people to talk about back in the day. And then they go ahead and make their state. Well, back in the day, they did this or back in the day. And people speak that way because they don't have any details. So I always tell students, what do you mean back in the day? Whose day? What day? As professionals, we don't talk about back in the day. That's too general. So we must put it in a time and place perspective. Otherwise, it will never really make sense. But but to say back in the day allows people to get away with general misinformation and not be held accountable. So I don't allow that because we must be very specific and detailed because people are often very liberal with creating wild stories that cannot be demonstrated. But to the question, I, I, I do deal with chronology in my book and uh and we know ology means the study of. So chronology means a study of time. Or so everything has to be, be put in a time sequence. So that's why we call it a chronology. So let me just share one section of the book here. So, um, I have a section on the chronology of Kemet. And in the chronology, one of the priests, Manetho, who was an African priest from from uh, the Greek period, which was thousands of years after uh, Kemet was uh, was created, made contributions old and, and had had uh, no longer ceased to be an independent Kemet. That's when the Greeks came in. But the Greeks didn't know anything. They asked a lot of questions. They actually pissed off one of the priests and said, you Greeks are like children. You don't know anything. You know, they, they were irritated because these were just slow learners and um, <laughs> took them a while. So the great priest Manetho was commissioned by the Greek foreigners who didn't know very much, who wanted to know about a history of Kemet. So Manetho, he divided the history of Kemet into 30 dynasties or 30, dynast or, or 30 family of rulers. This is the framework that he put together. And it's a useful framework because he's somebody at the time who could read the Medunetra and who lived during that time. So he was able to put together a 30 dynasty framework, which we still pretty much use today. So the Greeks and Romans and all of these, and the Arabs, they came so so late that the dynastic period was already over when they came. There were no more dynasties. Uh, so it was, our Kemet had already disappeared by that time. So uh, in this section, I have the dynasties here and one of the things I did was just to uh, make it as uh, general and simple as possible. So with the first family of rulers of the first dynasty, it is often said that it began around 3100 BCE. This is not accurate, but it's just a place to start. I would never argue that this is some accurate date because every generation, the uh, time that Kemet was established as a nation, it changes. So when I was an undergraduate, it was, uh, you know, a couple thousand years before this, or, or or maybe a few hundred years before, or a thousand years before. Some have pointed out the chronology of Herodotus and other writers who thinks it was tens of thousands of years old. So this Dynasty One date is just a general starting point. So this is why for the, for the dynasties, uh, I don't have any dates because people are not going to agree to the dates, but we clearly can identify eras or ages, and these are golden ages. So it's important to look at the chronology in that manner. So what I've done here to make it simple is that the blue text, the, what the bullet points, this is these are the periods where indigenous African rulers came from the south of Kemet, the south of Egypt, to organize Egypt into, or Kemet, that's the correct name, into one nation. So, so Narma, or Mina, he's the one that created the very first dynasty in whatever year that might have been. <clears throat> I'm just putting 3,100 years just so we have a starting point. But what's most important is not dates per se, but eras, because we don't know the dates. People make these things up. Uh, and, and all of these folks who have put together specific timelines and uh, they don't they don't work because there's artifacts that have been dated that are older than the time period in which they were supposedly created so it's a complete mess but anyway uh it's the pyramid age for example as i call it i'm following the uh the research of the late great asa hilliard dr asa hilliard whereas foreigners call it the old kingdom 
this doesn't tell us anything, but we certainly can identify with a pyramid age. So the so the step pyramid that was designed by the great Imhotep that falls into this period, and so do the other um, pyramids. We have over a hundred some odd pyramids, including the ones in Giza. So it's a pyramid, and these were Africans running and ruling the country. So for just about a thousand year period for dynasties one through six, and then there's a breakdown in central government. There's chaos. There's foreigners there, literally. There's foreigners, and there's also people who, there's multiple people claiming kingship, claiming rulership. So it's an intermediate period between the uh, the pyramid age and then the next golden age. So dynasty seven through 10 is chaos, is confusion, is warfare. There's no building pro there's no great building projects there's no colossal statues there's no pyramids there's, there's no elaborate uh tombs or temples or anything it is utter chaos is this the era of the of the hyksos or the, the, when the hyksos came in or the, the syrians who, who this, were the um, this was before the hyksos you have people that came in from the north okay and it's interesting because when you see the images of them they clearly are not not uh, Africoid people, and they don't look like the people in Kemet. And what we see is crude. I mean, it's it's hard to even call it art. It's just crude imitation that you would see with a first grader or a kindergartner that's barely learning to draw. And that's what you see. It's just it's very crude, clumsy, and incompetent art. So after this this intermediate period of 150 years or so, then there's another golden age where where. Again, you had Africans coming from the South to reestablish order, to reestablish another golden age. So it was Mintu Hotep the second. So I call this the literary age, following the great uh, understanding of Asa Hillary, but the Middle Kingdom doesn't tell us very much. So dynasties 11 and 12. Then after another golden age with great literature and great monuments built, then there's another period of chaos. This is when the Hyksos came in. The Hyksos are here during the latter second intermediate period. So around 15th and 16th dynasty is where you would have the Hyksos coming in from the east. And it's debated about their true origins, but we know that they were not indigenous to Kemet. And finally, to end this period of chaos, because it's the same thing as the first intermediate period, foreigners, chaos, confusion, no central rulership, no central king, no central royal family, people vying for the throne, all over, no building projects. It's total chaos, but it was a war of liberation. Africans, I mean, there's literally a, 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 a valiant war to liberate Kemet, and that takes place, and it's successful with uh, Black people, Africoid people in the 17th dynasty. And they finally kick out the Hyksos and subdue them and then create another golden age. Now, I have no idea why Manetho split the 17th and 18th dynasty because they're one family. So the 18th dynasty, they traced their lineage to the Africoid 17th dynasty uh, rulers. But this is one of the greatest ages where you have the 18th, 19th dynasty, some of the most elaborate in, uh, structures ever built, whether it's uh, Amenhotep III or Thutmosis III or whether it's Ramsey II or Seti the I. I mean, great, great builders. We call it the Temple Age. This lasts for a while. Then there are foreigners again and chaos and a reduction in, in art, and there's no production taking place. And now you have, in Dynasty 21, for the very first time, you have literally uh, white skin images. For the first time, white skin images. So this is around 1,000 or so BCE, but there's white skin images for the very, very first time. You don't see that at all, and they're literally painted white, because uh, a lot of the images might be executed on white limestone. So, but the but the African artisans never left the white uh, the the white limestone unpainted. They would always paint, but this time on stone, but even on papyrus, they're applying, particularly on papyrus for Dynasty Twenty One, they're applying white color to represent skin tone. And so this was a period of chaos. And the last great period was the 25th and 26th dynasties, the revival age. And this is when the, the Kushites come from deep in the south in Sudan to reestablish order. And when they came in the uh, 
the eighth century before the common era, the great Kushites coming from the deep part in Sudan, they, they unified the entire region from deep in Sudan all the way north into Kemet and established another golden age. So this is what people need to know. And in every case, the principles are the same. The uh, people that established the golden ages, they came from the south, Africoid people to establish order. And when they established another significant age, that's when the great building projects resume. That's when the great contributions to the world uh, resume. But during those intermediate periods with foreigners, uh, nothing was significant. So after the great period of the Kushites or, or so-called Ethiopians, and this is, uh, by the way, and this is when the uh, the outrageous propagandists during this period, that's when they talk about the so-called black pharaohs of the 25th dynasty. This is propaganda. What do you mean black pharaohs? Uh, they say black pharaohs in order to suggest that the first 24 dynasty did not have any black pharaohs, any black people, and uh, which is absurd. We don't talk about the white rulers of Rome. We just assume that they're of European descent. We don't talk about the white or European rulers of Greece. We assume that they are white from, from, from Greece. So why are people running around talking about the black pharaohs? This is simply terminology used to deceive and distort the history. So finally, to the question about foreigners, they come in after at the very end. The Assyrians came in and the Kushites had to try to push them back and organize the entire region under Kushite rule. But the Assyrians, they come from modern day Iraq and they came in uh, as warriors to take over the land. Then after the Assyrians, you got other foreigners, the Persians from modern day Iran. They came and noticed these years. Now you can start to deal with years because mm -hmm. it's closer to our time. They can be, but early than that, it's just guesswork. But here, the Persians, and then the last dynasty, as Manetho informs us, this is the last dynasty, Nectanebo II, the last one from Kemet to actually rule. And then we get the Persians again. And here's where the modern Europeans come in the Greeks under Alexander of Macedon. I didn't say Alexander the Great, nothing great about his exploits other than he's fighting and killing. And then the Romans and then the Arabs. So the people in Egypt today, mainly of Arab descent, they come from uh, they come from Saudi Arabia, they come from Lebanon, they come from many different places, but the people today have literally nothing to do with the ancient Kemet and those contributions I was showing earlier. So we're dealing with a bunch of foreigners who have taken it liberally to, to steal African contributions to humanity. So when we, when we properly look at the chronology or the timeline, these people are all at the end because they uh, came thousands of years later. And again, documentation beats conversation. So all that to say, it, we can show the images. This is Narma, the African ruler that organized Kemet. Here he is. He's the large figure as he's organizing Kemet. He didn't do it peacefully. I can tell you that. He comes in with mace in hand to knock an enemy over the head. <laughs> and he's uh, he's organizing, unifying Kemet. What you have here, this represents the unification of Kemet under one ruler. Who is that? Narma, this man here. And this is an image of him with his crown from the south. And this is an image of Narma here. On the back side, this is the front side of the left, uh, on the left, and the back side of this palette on the right. So on the left, he, he has his le his crown from the south. On the right, he has his crown representing the north, and these represent different districts. They have totems representing sacred animals from those districts as he organized the entire nation under one rulership, which then allowed for the, for the flowering of a great Kemet that we know of, pyramids and all of the other contributions, but there's no contributions until there's organization in, uh, under one leadership. So you can look at all of the most important images. There are Africoid people, including here. Let me zoom in just a little bit, but um, just to show you the images, this here is part of the brown paint on the image of Zoser. He's the king that commissioned the building of the Step Pyramid, the first stone building in the world. And not only this, brother Chuck, he only is his original brown paint, but he has he's wearing locks. So tell Rasta man, we appreciate the culture, but you didn't originate the locks. He's running a nation on his throne with Africoid locks. And so you have some of the most important figures 
such as these notables we saw, showed Ptahotep, but what about Hesse Ray, the first dentist in the history of humanity? And look, we have to agree to one thing, that he's got a beautiful Afro, but he just came from the barber. This is a fresh cut. <laughs> and you see, you see the helical structure of the hair, Africoid. How come we don't see this? Because the Africoid identity is too strong, too black, too powerful. So this is not some random image, but he's the oldest and the first known dentist in the history of the world. And, and all the of them have some healthy soup coolers on them too, brother. Oh yeah, those 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 juicy African no kissing lips. Huh? <laughs> those kissing lips, like here, <laughs> very statue on alert. I mean, you know, these lips are meant for smooching and, and affection. How are you going to be affectionate without lips? So uh, they, <laughs> the greatest statue on earth is Africa. And, you know, when I'm out in the field, I show people the original paint on the side, left and right side of the face of the greatest monument on earth. And then after an intermediate period, here's the great Mentu Hotep. This is why we don't see these images, because the Africa appearance is unmistakable and undeniable as people run around today trying to claim African identity, saying that they were the ones of the uh, of the time of the pharaohs. Really? Where's the document? You all came late. So uh, never forget, the Arabs came around 640 of the, of the common era, thousands of years later. And then every era, every golden age, you have Africa rulers, including Amos and Amos Nefertari. She's always depicted, by the way, as jet black every time. And um, so you can look, we can look at all of the images and see that there, how about this? Here you have Queen T on the right and Amenhotep III. These are the parents, the mother and father of King Tut. Now people say the, the grandfather and grandmother, probably not. This comes from some, some, uh, some shaky research, some, sh some shaky and phony research, but there's a monument that indicates that they, um, that they're the mother and father of Tutankhamen, King Tut. Either way, it's all in the same family, and there's nobody alive that can can deny the beautiful Africoid appearance and identity of these powerful um, African rulers. And during the 18th dynasty, this man here, along with his wife, is the single greatest builder, and as Africoid as they come. So we talk about contributions. Sometimes people don't have a problem with it, uh, even though theft is in order to steal uh, documents and names. But even those that say they don't have a problem with the contributions to humanity and writing and medicine and math and architecture and everything else, they have a problem with the, the way that people look. This is why these images are new for most people. This is why we don't normally see these. But I'm taking the image of um, people who are at the core of every golden age and the Africa identity it's unmistakable, it's undeniable, including the 25th dynasty and the great uh, Taharka. So, so brother, that's, um, you know, response to the question about the chronology, because these are all the African original builders, and we got to go all the way to the intermediate and, and, and the Greek and Roman period to see these images. And, and these are the ones that are that are thrown out front, because I can remember talking to you years ago in the 90s, you were talking about when you went through all these museums throughout Europe, what was stashed in the basement were the were us, and the ones they threw out front were uh, basically stuff that was just put out there for propaganda purposes. Very much so, very much so, and that's how museums are typical, typically organized, propaganda purposes and and deceptive des descriptions of the artifacts. So people have to be very careful. That's why I wrote the vanishing evidence of classical African civilizations, uh, dealing with the temple evidence, the museum evidence, and uh, and uh, the temple evidence, the, the museum evidence, and uh, the, let's see, temple, museum, and uh, tombs. In every case, there's been modern deception. We're not talking about people in antiquity. No, this is modern deception, 18th, 1800s, 1900s. Somebody say, well, how do you know? Well, glad you asked. I know that because I've documented it. Original field research to document the ongoing fraud that takes place. Stealing African land and then stealing African contributions to humanity. But when we look at the original evidence, there's no debate. There's no discussion. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, brother. Continue on. What else okay, you got for us? 
That's well, I could say uh, what else you want me to <laughs> I'm gonna keep you here from now on, brother. From now on, you know what? It, it's it's beautiful, yeah. man, to see you showcase our history like this. Because one of the things that you really stress in your book is focusing in on doing primary research, separating the different types of research. Because unfortunately, not only do we have folks who are trying to rob us of our historical legacy. We have some of our own folk who, in their own zeal and enthusiasm, have uh, perpetrated a lot of information that doesn't have the, the, the academic integrity, it doesn't have the, 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 the credibility that it should have, it doesn't have that, 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 that support that it should have, that, that, that many narratives that are out there. We got a lot of YouTube folk out there that are uh, spewing a lot of nonsense, and so it's a blessing, man, to to talk to brothers like you, scholars like you, who are doing the, doing the hard work, doing the research and being able to document and substantiate uh, your, your, your narratives. Talk about it a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that because, you know, you're, you're completely um, correct that there's nothing more important than primary or firsthand research. That's what separates the best from the rest when we're out in the field to go directly to the sites and sources. And uh, that's there's nothing more important than that. Reading what others have written is fine, but there's another level. It's doing original primary research. And so I wrote the Vanishing Evidence series because I did the first-hand research in the temples, the tombs, uh, pyramids, museums, and, and you name it. And so this is absolutely... So I started my primary research to make sure that, because I wanted to know. It was intriguing listening to some of the scholars and I began to read when I was an undergraduate at Morgan State University, but I had an opportunity to go to Europe and to go to the museums to 11 European countries. And uh, I went to, I, I was based in England in 89 and 90, I was doing pioneering work. And I, then I went to do uh, work in museums and archives in East Germany and West Germany. Now they're one Germany. I went to Austria, Italy, Spain, France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, and Sweden. A systematic assessment and examination of artifacts, the descriptions, as uh, looking at the original archaeological reports, and uh, and then also looking at museum layout. So, for example, uh, I recognized that there was the doctoring up. There was the fraudulent uh, presentation of statues that and artifacts that had no uh, damage. Paint was pristine during discovery or after discovery. Why? Because you can see the original excavation photographs, but then when it's, it's displayed, all of a sudden the paints are missing. They've been stripped. So the dark pigmentation uh, representing skin tone is gone. And most people don't, don't pay that much attention to it. How do I know? I'll spend hours literally not just studying artifacts, but studying people who are going in the room to see the artifacts, to see what kind of impact that was being made on, on people who were unsuspecting. So they're looking at a statue, and most people look at the upper body of a statue and the face. So I'm observing this, making detailed notes, and I noticed that the conspirators after discovery, and who are the conspirators? I'm talking about archaeologists, <clears throat> Egyptologists, Museum curators, museum officials, museum restorers, conservationists, and um, these are the ones that have been involved with the fraudulent, what I call de Africanization. So the de Africanization continues to take place, but I began to notice this amazing pattern of the people who had to have spent thousands of hours collectively doctoring up images. Because when I looked at the images, I'm noticing that. You can only see the, the original dark brown paint, or in some cases, reddish brown paint, if you look at the feet and the ankles and the calf. Looking at that, they're looking at the upper, because there's so many artifacts around. People are not studying. So I learned, uh, Brother Chuck, I learned that um, to understand it, you have to look at these statues and release with the eye of not a casual observer, but the eye of an optometrist looking at it with tremendous detail. And then you can see the traces of brown paint where the conspirators were not that careful. 
you'll see brown paint in different corners or you see brown paint in one area or not. And people don't pay attention to it because most of the regular statues, for example, or reliefs, they were executed on limestone, which has a white surface. So they're looking at a white surface. And I so I noticed the and documented the systematic de-Africanization by lightening colors, erasing colors. And then if they don't completely erase colors, the nice dark brown rich color now is a yellowish color. I said, damn, these people are pathological. And, and then even more than that, it's, and so most people notice, and this is, you can only note it from meticulous primary or firsthand research, but a lot of people will say, I see it online. I see it in my workshops or people or class. People say, yeah, you know, uh, why, are, why are all the noses knocked off? They always knock the noses off. I say, yes, that's a good observation. And they, and so what the mainstream interpretation is, is that, well, the, the noses were knocked off in antiquity because the foreigners came in and they didn't want the statue to have any kind of efficacy or any kind of power. So if they knocked the nose off, then that person could not live in the spirit world afterwards. They wouldn't have the apparatus to breathe. Yeah, that's a convenient, uh, that, that's a convenient uh, explanation. But here's what's more uh, prevalent than noses knocked off. And here's where it's hard to notice unless you have been given a heads up and given some examples. There are more noses that have been reshaped and remolded after discovery. So that if somebody's looking at it with great, great detail, you have to spend hours on one statue or a couple statues and looking at it from different angles. And then you can see that, the, like, for example, if this was a statue, the smooth finish is smooth all over and you have lights from above so you can see it's, it's shining off of that other than one area. And that is the bridge in the nose, rough. And it's it's like, well, why is that rough only there? It's out of proportion. It's not natural. doesn't make sense. And it's subtle until you look at it. And, and here's what really taught me that. I had spent hundreds and hundreds of hours in the British Museum as I, I was camped in London as my base to go to the different museums and make the analysis. And I remember there was a sister from Ghana, and I took her to the British Museum one day in, a, in a, the downstairs gallery where there's some colossal statues. I said, take a look at this African. And she looked. We actually were not that far away, maybe seven, ten feet. And she said, he don't look African to me. I thought she was kidding at first. I really thought she was playing. I said, what? You don't think he looks African? She said, no, he don't look African to me. I said, take a look at the, the juicy kissing lips. Take, take a look at the facial structure. This is clearly Africoid. So then I said, so... I had noticed, even though I'm looking for, I had noticed that the modern racist had systematically shaved both the left and right side of the nose so that it's not as wide as it naturally and originally was. So it was a more straighter nose with an aquiline appearance. And I didn't notice that until I said, you know what? Well, let's take a look. So we walked on the other side of the gallery and that's the first time I said, damn, I didn't notice that the nose makes no sense. It, does, it That's the only thing out of proportion. How do you have a face like that with a thin nose? So this, so that's when I began to notice that it was another level of debauchery taking place. It was a whole nother level of criminal intent. So the shaving off of the width of the nose, reshaping the nose is far more common than noses being knocked off. And hardly anybody would notice this because you can't notice that from a picture. You have to be there in person. But one of the things I wanted to point out is uh, this, this phenomenon of the dark legs, colorless face. And one thing I neglected to point out is that you see the middle figure here. You notice this dark coloration, which is consistent with all the other images of these men as they are in procession to the right. But notice the central figure. Notice how a modern museum official have uh, reconstructed his face. As you can see that this is light and white and is not natural at all. If you look closely at the nose, it has been recarved from the top of the nose and the, the bottom and to give it a point, uh, a point to it, an aquiline appearance. And this face has nothing to do with how the original figures would have, the figure would have looked like. If you look at every one of these other images, they have the fleshy, 
African nose and nostril, which is obvious for anybody that has any even close to 2020 vision. Look at the coloration of the body and the face in this one. Look how unnaturally white it is by people who have deliberately de-Africanized and demelanized this image and gave him a pointed, unnatural, and completely absurd look. This is the kind of thing that takes place after discovery. It can't be any more obvious than this. There's nothing natural could have, could, uh, have uh, brought about this radical racial facial change other than someone who's engaged in deliberate fraud and deceit. That's exactly what we have here, and this is very common. And notice that the conspirators here, they didn't change the image of the, the men on the, on the left or the men on the right. They didn't bother them. The average person is going to look at this and see the great official, and they're going to look, what, front and center. Front and center, and that's where you see the, uh, the fraud and the phony uh, activity that goes on behind, be, behind the scenes. This is what we're dealing with here is uh, a deliberate falsification of evidence by museum officials, not by somebody in antiquity. And then no one in antiquity would have any motive to alter image. They're not concerned about that. If they went to destroy something, they destroy the whole scene. They don't carefully change facial features and erase the melanin content. So when you come here, point that out to people who, uh, who have a fantasy that that, uh, that black people are just paranoid. It's not paranoid, this is the obvious fact. So it is the stripping of colors on reliefs and statues. It is the lightening of colors on reliefs and statues. It's the reshaping of noses, not only on statues, but on reliefs. They do it and people don't notice until I point it out. I said, now take a look at this relief. You notice that the person has a real pointy nose. But take a look at all of the damage on that part of the relief. And you notice that there's no other damage on that relief at all. But notice that there's damage where the modern conspirators took some kind of sanding device to sand down the original nose and then some tool. They usually use scalpels or something like that to recarve a crude, clumsy, and incompetent modern nose. So the noses are reshaped. And, and when you look at the reliefs, the color is not even the same because what they were doing the work is usually, well, sometimes it's darker, but a lot of times it's white, it's lighter because they will reshape, then they'll use some kind of super white putty to cover up their dirty deeds. And um, I challenge anybody in the world to say it ain't so. People run around talking, but documentation beats conversation. I have thousands of photographs. I have video footage and it's clear. But unless someone knows that, from the field work, they won't know. So yes, noses are knocked off, but far more noses are reshaped and recarved, and far more images have been completely stripped of the original beautiful brown and sometimes jet black color. This is why I encourage people to join me in Kemet because I go to more sites and, and more monuments with more observation. Not that other tours are not good, but but than any other because this. The tours, they stem from my original field work, uh, where I was doing field work first, and then I decided to bring people to... So Sweden. when is your next tour? When's your next tour, brother? The next tour to Kim is going to be June 8th through the 22nd, uh, 2024. Okay. So 15 days. Yeah, June 8th to the 22nd. Do, do you go every year or a couple times a year? or what's you have one scheduled uh, after that? Well, right after that, I have a trip to Ethiopia from uh, June okay. 25th through July 10th. So Kemet, and then uh, 16 days, not 12, not 10, not but 16 days in Ethiopia, 15 days in Kemet, then Ethiopia, an uh, educational tour. And after that, I'll be doing field research in uh, South Sudan. Okay, uh, now we're going to put all that up on, 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 the, on the site so everybody can know when it is. I want to shift gears here before I let you go, because there's a couple of topical things I want you to touch on. Uh, we just came through Netflix controversy over Cleopatra or, or Cleopatra the seventh, which is kind of like a nothing burger, really. But now, and I don't know whether I've been able to confirm that Netflix is going to do a piece uh, featuring Denzel Washington. That's what the chatter is for uh, 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 Hannibal. And I understand that some of the Tunisians have their uh, are having a hissy fit 
uh, and uh, threatening to sue. And of course, I think that some of the Egyptians were the same thing. I would love to see someone actually file a lawsuit and have it played out. It would be almost like the old uh, Ali Frazier fights or all the big, huge pay-per-view fights. Someone should put together something like that so we could snuff this garbage out once and for all with, with, with everyone who's interested looking on. You know what I mean? Just, okay, bring your, bring your documentation. Sort of like what, what Diop and Obenga did uh, during the UNESCO uh, conference and just bring all your stuff and let's let, let us we're going to shut you down for lasting for for all. But anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about um, talk a little bit about uh, uh, Hannibal uh, and uh, the was he a black African? Talk about the, the brother that jumped on the on the elephants and went across the house. <laughs> yeah, it's very important. And you're right to point that out, that people have been jumping up and down about Cleopatra and the Egypt movie. And now uh, they're jumping up and down and, and uh, having issues with Hannibal. But they, it's amazing how people want to come to Africa and claim African greatness. Uh, these are This is delusions of grandeur, uh, what we're dealing with. So those folks in Tunisia need to go sit down like the people in Egypt had to go sit down because they couldn't stop the Cleopatra. But they had no problem when uh, she was only white and just straight propaganda, one movie after another, and then all of a sudden there's issues. But clearly Hannibal uh, and his great leadership, I mean, he's well-known, he's well-documented. So, you know, Hannibal uh, crossing the Alps, this is one of the great stories, but we noticed that he comes from a region where you have Africoid people, Black people, uh, those of African descent, making important contributions a couple thousand years ago. He's a great general. He's not the first, but he's certainly an important one. There's many from uh, long before him, but it's like the that area there, uh, you know, they're the 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 near the Mediterranean, this has always been an area where people have um, created myth-making. So like, for example, there's a, Egyptologists have always talked about a Mediterranean type. And what they meant by Mediterranean type that, that was in the region, they meant white. That was a cold word for white. So this is how Hannibal lost his, uh, lost his melanin, just like everybody else because of the ongoing propaganda. So clearly, it's amazing how people lose their melanin, they lose their identity, and then you have people who are latecomers. Remember, there were no Arabs in the region until after 640 of uh, the Common Era. But, um, you know, it's about African uh, uh, military genius that's get, that, that, that has been attempted to be stolen. So people can jump up and down all they want, but it doesn't change the historical facts. So that's what we, you're dealing with. People have no problem when it's business as usual but they have a big problem as soon as anybody representing an historical figure like Hannibal, uh, suddenly, all of a sudden, he's lost his identity. I would recommend that people read about the great exploits of Hannibal. And one of my late great colleagues, uh, the great Ivan Van Sertema, he edited, um, you know, Great Black Leaders, Ancient and Modern. So people should read that aspect uh, that issue of the Journal of African Civilizations to learn more about it, because clearly the movie is going to be out there. But uh, and people even did a change.org petition. Can you imagine that? Change.org petition to try to stop the Cleopatra movie. And they was, but luckily and thankfully, change.org took it down mm. because you know, this is a movie. If you don't like it, that's your problem. They're going to try to do the same thing. So people should know that this kind of theft, theft of identity is what takes place, as I showed earlier, with documents and so many other things. Maybe I'll, I'll share um, these quick slides here just to give some kind of context. But it's amazing how these people will steal African stuff and don't even think about it. We Let me show this here. Um, and sorry, I meant to show. Yeah, I can say quite a lot about math, but um, and the theft of so-called Pythagorean theorem the man had nothing to do with the theorem. It was already known more than a thousand years before his mama knew him. This should be the Amos theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But I wanted to show, um, sorry, I, uh, let's see. You look as as so you look for that, I don't want to let you go without talking about Carter G. Woodson. I mean, we're going to we're going to upload this during Black History Month or more accurately stated African Heritage Month. And of course, 
Uh, Carter G. Woodson is the founder of uh, our Black History Month or Negro History Week and what have you, which has culminated into Black History Month. I've never liked, uh, here it is, uh, brother called me a, 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 a Dr. Blackness, uh, <laughs> what Kevin Eubanks uh, characterized me. It was kind of like a joke. Uh, and, and, and the reason being is because I, some of it was sarcasm and some of it was just out of out of, uh, out of respect for the fact that I'm really very much into our history. But I, yeah. wanted to, I want to make sure that we give uh, uh, Carter G. Woodson his props, uh, because uh -huh. as you point out in your book, he, uh, there was a lot more to uh, what his body of work than just a focus on African-American history. So we want to talk about that. But go ahead, pick up where you were at, and we'll, we'll get to Carter G. Woodson after that. Okay, well, let me just briefly say that one of the most significant contributions among many that Africans from the classical African civilization of Kemet have contributed is the high status of women and the central role of women. So in the West, women have never had and never been respected. They couldn't vote, couldn't hold office. Women had to fight just to get the right to vote in the U.S. in 1920, white women that is. But black women have never had any any issues like that. They've always been central to uh, to governance. They've always had a central role. Here are five female rulers from Kemet going back to the very first dynasty, and um, but five of them that played a very significant role. And these are just the women who ruled because their uh, son son was too young or there was no male heir. So when people are thinking about and talking about kings, they don't recognize that even though the king, the male might be the symbol of authority, the source of that authority was always the women. So the the throne was passed from female to female. This is why you have men having to marry their sister. It was a political marriage. Then they would marry someone for conjugal purpose in order to have children. So the women are the ones that were responsible for the throne. And when there was any kind of political chaos or uh, or no male heir, this is when the women would step up and rule uh, until there was a male that could, uh, could serve as ruler or co-ruler. And so it's important to know that, that everyone had their role and women had a very central political role. So, so the one that people know the most is Hatshepsut. They said he, she had to dress like a man and all this other nonsense. Here's Hatshepsut on the left, male or female, clearly female. So people don't even know what they're talking about. This is just Westerners who want to always find something negative and outlandish about ancient Africa because they recognize that when Kemet and, and African contributions are elevated and built up, it shows how far behind, thousands of years behind, Western culture is. And women have to fight. Even in the propaganda that Greek culture, the Greeks supposedly created democracy in Athens, Greece. How could the Greeks create democracy when uh, 90, 80 to 90% of the people in Greece had no rights. Women had no rights. The poor had no rights. Slaves had no political rights. Foreigners had no rights. They couldn't vote, couldn't hold office. They were not even citizens. But yet we're told the propaganda that somehow democracy began in, in, in Athens. No such thing. And women were, were uh, they had no real role, political role. On the opposite end, we have Hatshepsut about 1500 BCE. Not only is she presented as a woman, but on the back of the of her throne are they are her titles. And this is a half a loaf of bread, which is the T sound T, um, and it's the feminine ending to something. Just like in let's say Spanish, you add an A to feminize a word. So this normally is a title uh, meaning great God. So it would be nefer netcher, but it's not nefer netcher, it's neferet netcheret, meaning her female. And then this is uh, usually this these symbols here means this here means lord or ruler of the two lands. Those are the two lands that I mentioned earlier where Narma organized northern and southern Kemet. So these lines represent the two lands. Normally it would just be Neb Tawi or ruler 
or Lord of the two lands, but it's not Neb Tawi. We see the, the T, which is a half a loaf of bread, is Nebet Tawi, the female ruler of the two lands. So they're very specific about her female identity. She's not trying to imitate some man. Even when you see Hashem sit with a beard, here's her name, by the way, in the Shinu, which is the ring of eternity, uh, Ma'at Ka-Ra, which is a great name. Truth is the Ka of Ra, or truth is the spirit of the god Ra. And when you see her in other instances with a beard, it's because it's simply part of the uniform. Nothing more than that. Just like if somebody looks at a police, a female police officer here in the U.S., they don't be wearing a skirt and heels. No, that's not part of the uniform. They're not trying to be male. That's just part of the uniform. And and by the way, if someone really looks at traditional African culture, they'll know that the beard, the beard is just as much as an important symbol of authority as a crown. It's the beard. So that's why you might see her with a beard. But this is why this is really important to know this is a unique African contribution. So people should stop with the misinf inf misinformation and propaganda that the oldest profession among women was prostitution. And where? Where at? You know, well, back in the day, whose day? What day? Not in Africa? Show me. Show any evidence. And there is none. But here's uh, Hatshepsut, the great ruler, a great builder, one of the greatest builders, Hatshepsut, who ruled for 20 years peacefully, a peaceful builder. This is one of her great structures, Desher Desheru, the sacred of the most sacred. This is uh, her mortuary or, or funerary temple. And you see the three levels. It looks like a modern government building. This is the kind of extraordinary contribution to show the high status and the power of women in antiquity. And this is not an oddity. There's a whole tradition of female rulership. So that's why we need to know about these important contributions. No matter where someone is, they can go to the museum, whether it's uh, Cairo or New York. And there's many different statues of Hatshepsut and monuments where you can, you can see her greatness and her great building projects, such as here, the Tekken, so-called obelisk. Here's another Tekken. And when you have more than one Tekken, they, they're called Tekken New. To pluralize something, you add a U. This is 97 feet and an estimated 320 tons. This is where the Washington Monument came from. Absolutely. Well, let's, yes, it, it's where the Washington Monument comes from. And that's important to know is that the uh, Washington Monument comes exactly from here, uh, from there. So you, you're absolutely correct. I thought I had that here. But anyway, yes, the Rostin Monument comes from there. So clearly that's what we need. This is, yeah, this is what I wanted to uh, to show in terms of the Washington Monument is, you're right. So here's the original. This is her father, Thutmose's first. This is his Tekken. And then George Washington. Well, how did that happen? Well, Washington was a Mason, and he was fond of the contributions from Kemet. So you have this uh, Washington Monument and the reflecting pool in Washington, D.C., modern, and, uh, you know, not even 150 years ago, but here's the modern one copied from the original at the Karnak Temple. You have the original Tekkenu here. Here's the other one, and the Sacred Lake. So this is not a coincidence that... Um, that 3,000 years later, you have an original African set up Tekkenu and the Sacred Lake and then the Washington Monument and Reflecting Pool. So, so many contributions have been uh, taken and distorted. So we need to know this not only in February throughout the year, we need to know this 366. Yeah, I did say that, 366 days a year. And one of the great things that I that is a problem that people need to know, and I have a section of this in the book, is that Carter G. Woodson always focused on African civilizations from, from the very beginning. If people look at when he founded African Heritage Month in 1926, it was a week. It was Negro History Week in February of 26. But he always, very early on, focused on Africa, not only um, with the themes of uh, every year, the themes of his organization, the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, with an Africa theme, literally, but also in his own writings, he wrote several books on Africa. The last two books were on Africa, like the African background 
uh, African, African background outline and also African heroes and heroines. These are the last two books that he wrote, literally, on Africa. In fact, the last article series that he wrote, very last, he passed in 1950. He wrote a three-part article series in 1949 and 50, and he simply called it Egypt. That's the last essay series. So his last set of essays on Egypt or Kemet, his last two books on African heroes and heroes and African civilization and his or and, and the publications, the uh, the journal now it's called the Journal of African American History. Then it was the Journal of Negro History. The very first volume, literally the very first volume, Africa, and then the 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 bulletin that they created in 1937 for teachers. Even the bulletin of, of uh, they call the bulletin Negro History bulletin. Even the bulletin designed for teachers. The very first issue dealing with Africa. And yet people have these celebrations in February and they call it Black History Month. I call it African Heritage Month because that's in the tradition of Carter G. Woodson. If no one is celebrating effectively and accurately in the tradition of Woodson, if they leave out Africa. Thank you for saying that, because that's been my biggest beef with Black History Month. And, and a lot of the stuff that you see on local news, I mean, they call themselves being liberal and you know, they'll give you some little tidbit. It's a first. This person was a first. This person was a first. And, you know, you don't want to make light of the of the uh, of the slavery emancipation era. I mean, that's a, a, a an era of great triumph over uh, unbelievable circumstances. So, I mean, there are, you know, the Benjamin Bannikers, the, the, the Harriet Tubman's, the Sojourner Truths and the, the Martin Delaney's and, and Frederick Douglass's and all of that. It's beautiful. There's to be focused in on. But that's only one small slice of our history. And uh, even though Kevin Eubanks, got, you know, hit me with that Dr. Blackness thing, I'll wear that because uh, that was what kind of generated him calling me that is because, uh, you know, I had a I had a beef with the way that uh, the whole Black History Month is structured. Listen, brother, I, I can't thank you enough. I mean, I'm full right now, man. Uh, that was a beautiful uh, piece of discourse we just went through. And I just was sitting there, brother, quiet at your feet, as I normally do when I'm talking to people who know what they're talking about, who have done their homework. I want to thank you so very much for taking time out. And I want to get you back on again. <laughs> because what I want to focus in on is destroying this notion of, of the lack of a, an ac uh, architectural heritage of African people. Uh, to, to, to get into some of the structures that were built, two-story, three-story structures with indoor plumbing and the whole nine yards. I mean, mind-blowing stuff that we don't know about because we've never been taught it, going back to the miseducation of the Negro that, uh, that Carter G. Woodson got into. Again, brother, thank you so very much, brother. I really appreciate it. Appreciate yes. all that you do. Uh, let me put the brother's book up here. Yes. And it's... Uh, uh, a history of, of ancient uh, of uh, African civilizations. It's an excellent book. It's very easy to digest. Uh, I highly recommend that you purchase it, uh, that you use it as a te teaching uh, vehicle with your with your children, your grandchildren. Brothers like this brother right here are really doing us a great service by doing the hard work, digging in, and doing primary research. Uh, for our own benefit. So thanks again, brother. I appreciate you. Well, thank you, brother Chuck. I'm, I'm, I'm always glad to be with you and, and to share a little bit. Thank you, my brother. Until next time, brother. Peace. Peace.